Islam, Religion, History, and Civilization is Syed Hossein Nasser's primer on the faith and traditions of 1.2 billion adherents. He spoke about it recently in Washington, D.C. for about 50 minutes. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Barnes & Noble Georgetown. I am your host. My name is Greg Scheitler. The Middle East region and the religion of Islam have been a part of a special attention ever since the events of 9-11 and, of course, the military actions now taking place in Iraq. Although the archaeological records of Palestine date back to at least 10,000 years and the civilization and religion of Islam span over 14 centuries, contemporary media and policymakers alike are still trying to gain a better understanding of Islam. Today, we welcome the world's leading authority on Islam. Tonight's guest was born in Tehran, Iran, and received his advanced education at MIT and Harvard University. From 1958 to 1979, he returned home to teach at Tehran University, where he also served as Dean of the Faculty of Letters and Vice Chancellor. He founded the Iranian Academy of Philosophy and served as its first president. Currently, he is Professor of Islamic Studies at George Washington University right here in Washington, D.C., and is president of the Foundation for Traditional Studies, discussing the book Islam, Religion, History, and Civilization, published by HarperCollins. Please make welcome Dr. Syed Hossein Nasser. Good evening. It's first of all a great pleasure to be here. Uh, until 9-11, Barnes & Noble never carried any of my books. So, <laughs> so it's surprising that I keep having to ha do these events in Barnes & Noble. Uh, when this tragedy occurred, I was not in this country. I was in Egypt. And when I returned, uh, many requests were made to appear in the media. I discovered that you have a large number of experts who do not know A from B in Arabic, they don't know what the Arabic alphabet starts with. So I decided that there's only one more expert. And I have refused to really participate in any of these programs, except a few small things like with Mr. Abernathy and the religion and ethics program. On the media, I wish what uh, my host said were true, that there is a great deal of desire on behalf of the media to understand Islam. I think that's only half the truth. The other half is not to understand Islam and to present this misunderstanding as understanding by experts who know nothing about the subject or, or who are ideologues who are pushing for a particular agenda. Uh, when I came back, Harper Collins asked me if I would uh, write a book on the anniversary, to come out on the anniversary of 2001, that is September 2002, the book The Heart of Islam, which some of you are carrying in your hands. And they said, in addition to this, we want to have a basic introduction to Islam. I wish there are many, but they, they thought that my humble words might be appropriate at this time. So something I, which I'd written before, I had to revise and make additions to, and this book uh, is a little book, Islam, Religion, History, and Civilization came out. I don't want to say too much about this book itself. I mean, that uh, uh, obviously is your interest in the subject, that's why you've come here. But to say a few words, of the significance of the subject and why, in fact, I've given this title to it. Islam, of course, is a religion, but it also has had a 1,400-year history. And it's also the breathing spirit, the presiding idea, the formative force of a major global civilization, Islamic civilization, which still today spreads from the Atlantic to the China Sea. And despite the weakening of the civilization, is very far from being dead. So when we think of Islam, we must think on three different levels. First of all, the religion with all these different aspects, which is not only law and ethics, but also thought and philosophy and theology and spirituality and literature and poetry and the like. And of course, the great art which Islamic civilization created. But we also think of a long history in which Islam interacted with the West in many ways, sometimes very positively, sometimes negatively. 
and this history must be known because we relive it. The extremists today who are trying to, in fact, uh, dominate and opt all the religions of the world, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, as well as Hinduism and other religions, non-Abrahamic religions, uh, they oftentimes take recourse to these old encounters and ideas which are embedded deep in the psyche of people. For Western people, there's nothing that is close to them as Islamic civilization and also nothing that has served historically as the other, as that which is totally other as Islamic civilization. Because as I've often said over the years, when Western civilization was going through its formative years, that it was forming as a civilization, which is the Middle Ages, the only other that the West knew was Islam and Islamic civilization. Classical Western civilization knew no other other. It did not know the Chinese civilization, the Japanese civilization, the Indian civilization, nor the civilizations of black Africa. And therefore, Islam played a kind of uh, opponent through which the West defined itself. Oftentimes, Islam was defined in the Western mind as a way for the West to define itself. And it's this which is extremely sensitive and extremely crucial because with this uh, was combined the idea that Christianity was based on the only Son of God and there could not be another religion after Christianity which would be acceptable and viable. And so very rapidly Islam was cast into the religious image of a heresy. And in fact, as a, as a Christian heresy, not a Jewish heresy or something else, but a Christian heresy. Uh, this was combined with a great sense of fear and trepidation because of the tremendous power that Islamic civilization exerted at that time. And if you were a Frenchman living in the year 1000, 1000 years ago, uh, the Muslims were right on this side of the Pyrenees. And just a few years before that, they were inside France in uh, Narbonne and Carcassonne, which they ruled for several centuries and whose architecture is, still reflects that period. The result of this was a kind of vilification which made it extremely difficult for even well-meaning Western theologians and writers to understand what the Islamic religion was. That doesn't mean that no one attempted to do so. Peter the Venerable, who had the Quran translated for the first time into Latin a thousand years ago, although the purpose of this was to be able to give a rebuttal to Islam, nevertheless was interested in the text of the Quran and of course the great thinkers of the Middle Ages, people like St. Thomas Aquinas, Don Scotus, uh, of course uh, Raymond Lull, uh, the first Bacon, Roger Bacon and many others were deeply interested in Islamic thought and one cannot of course understand Western thought without the impact of Islamic thought upon it as I said in the formative period of Islamic the of Christian theology and philosophy. And of course, in this process of relationship between Islam and the West, the Jewish community in Spain played a very, very important role. And it's one of the great paradoxes of history that today, as the Western people see it, the destiny of Judaism is on the side of the Christian world against the Islamic world. This was not the case for the last 1300 or 1400 years. In fact, the situation was such that when Spain was reconquered, by Elizabeth and Ferdinand, uh, it was not only the Muslims, but also the Jews who were either expelled from Spain or forced into conversion. And most of the people who migrated away from Islam, the Jews and the Muslims did so together. And even the word anti-Semitism, which is brandished about all the time, even by people who are not at all against Judaism, but might be against certain actions taking place in Palestine or by Israeli army or something like that, I mean, they're called anti-Semitic. This term was first used in Spain against Muslims. And it was later on extended to Judaism. So the destinies of the two people, the Jews and the Muslims in Europe, were very much intertwined for a very, very long time. It is these truths that need to be brought out. Especially now, uh, because for 50 years since the Second World War, for the first time, there was a very important attempt made on behalf of Christians in the West to finally have an understanding of Islam. Now, understanding of Islam began in the 19th century on a scholarly level by European so-called Orientalists. But these were many of them were people who were either at the service of various colonial powers like France and England, or they were people who were, in a sense, bound 
within the so-called methods of scholarship which had grown, grown out of the Age of Enlightenment and which emphasized certain forms of rationalism and denial of the transcendent, denial of revelation. And therefore, you had a whole body of knowledge which was growing up in the West, but not at all in sympathy to the subject matter that was being studied. As I said, after the Second World War, gradually a change came about. Of course, before the Second World War, there were individual exceptions, such great scholars as Louis Massignon, Corbin, people like that who started activities before the Second World War and in case of Corbin and continued two decades, three decades afterwards, three decades after it. Uh, these people were really exceptions to the rule. Meanwhile, of course, Islam had also begun to spread within the West itself. It is very interesting to note that the presence of Islam in Europe, the presence of Islam in Europe was there, but they did not enter into the consciousness of Europeans after the Middle Ages. It did enter into their consciousness before the Middle Ages. When you think that Albania has been Muslim for nearly 600 years, or Bosnia, and there were all these centuries, not only a few peasants in the hills or a few shepherds shepherding a few sheep in the hills of Albania, but there were intellectual, spiritual movements, presences of great importance, but and that Albania is only 25 minutes flight to Rome, and that no one ever talked about this. It meant that, in a sense, the paradigm that was created after the Renaissance, in a sense, excluded the presence of Islam in Europe. Although Christianity was becoming weakened through secularism, the idea of Fort Europe as a fort for Christianity was an idea that continued. And I mention that because it is extremely important at the present moment. Some people are trying to revive this idea. Against this, after the Second World War, first of all, the Catholic Church began to rethink its relationships with the Islamic world. Uh, although, of course, I'm not a Catholic, I, I'm a Muslim, but I've had a lot to do very close by firsthand with the transformations that have come over the Catholic world, especially in its theology of the study of other religions, particularly Islam. I've had contact with Cardinal Pinedoli, the first cardinal that was chosen for non-Christian religions by the Vatican. He and I were very close friends for many years until his untimely death, and many other people, leading Catholic theologians. I do not believe that it was only Vatican II that opened the door to a sympathetic study of Islam. This really goes back to Pope uh, Pius XII, who is not very popular these days because of certain misunderstandings of his position in the Second World War. It was he who, when he sent an ambassador to Libya, and we have the record of that, he said, do not think you, go to, you are going to people who do not believe in God. These people have faith in the same God that we worship. But after 1964, when an official step was taken to open the door for the understanding of Christianity by Christianity of other religions, many, many important steps were taken, ecumenical meetings in Europe, in the Islamic world itself, in America, and that was soon joined by the mainstream Protestant churches. That is the World Council of Churches, which included such denominations as Episcopalianism, Methodism, Presbyterianism, the Church of Christ, and also Orthodoxy, Greek and Russian Orthodoxy, because they're part of the World Council of Churches. Now, for 50 years, people worked on all the three sides of the divide, not two sides, that is on the Jewish side, Christian side, and Islamic side, for a better understanding of each other. And unfortunately, all of this is now being threatened by, a, by an exclusivism with a very thick wall in which people who are terrorists and people who are preaching in Georgia are saying the same thing, except in different language, and emphasizing over and over again complete exclusivity, mutual exclusion. And of course, we have the pseudo-myth of the clash of civilizations, which uh, all of you know about, which was made famous by the book of Samuel Huntington from Harvard University. But the idea was around before that, and people have pounced on that. So we live in a very critical moment of human history. In the same way that is absolutely incumbent for Muslims in the Islamic world to understand the West better, and not to simply follow ho hollow slogans. It's also extremely important for the West to understand the Islamic world. This is even more important because there are no Muslim planes flying over Louisiana and bombing it. Uh, the power comes from only one side at this moment of history. And with power comes responsibility. 
those who have power in their hand, their ignorance will be much more dangerous than those who have no power. I've always said that it is not consequential for the future of the world if people in Brazil do not have a deep understanding of Islam, but it's extremely consequential if people walking down on M Street uh, have this ignorance, because ignorance combined with power is a very dangerous and lethal combination. And we live in this period. It's uh, really abominable. Uh, I've studied in this country. I went to high school here. I did my college studies in this country. I've taught for this many years, even before I came here, and then permanently living in this country since 1979. I'm really very, very sad, and it's abominable how much not only ignorance, but also misinformation, and worse than that, disinformation, parade around as knowledge, usually wrapped in the flag of patriotism, which is not if I patriotic at all. Anyone who has a deeper love for humanity and who wants God not only to bless America, but to bless the rest of his creation, and who knows that no single nation, no matter how powerful, can survive in the world without both the knowledge and empathy of others, I think will be interested in knowing more about Islam, which is not the only force, but one of the major forces in the world today outside of the West. And then we have, of course, for the first time, a sizable Islamic community living in America, six, seven million people, and a large number in Europe, up to 25 million is the estimate that has been given. And so uh, for the first time in history, you have a reciprocity. Uh, throughout history, Christians lived in the Islamic world. Jews lived in the Islamic world. Of course, Jews, and Jews didn't live among the Muslims of China, there were just a few, but the heartland of the Islamic world, that is Persia, Iran, Turkey, the Arab world, there was nobody in any of the cities who did not have a Christian or Jewish friend, who did not know someone next door. But the reverse was not true. And now you have a situation on the ground in which you have a situ situation in Washington similar let's say, to Damascus. In Damascus, there are a large number of Christians who live there, who have shops, who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are engineers. And now we find the same thing in Washington or San Francisco or New York. And there must be this corresponding uh, uh, attempt at understanding and uh, co accommodation to live with the other uh, amidst the community and society. The case of America is very special because America is not really an ordinary nation. It's a microcosm of the world. And since God created this nation so that it would be a kind of microcosm of the world. For a long time, its heritage was Protestant European. Later on, the Catholics came in. They were not accepted very easily. People forgot or have forgotten what people wrote in the 1860s, 1870s about the Catholics. And then came the Greek Orthodox, came the large Jewish community. And in each of these cases, it was a tremendous uh, re resistance. And uh, then people from the Far East, Buddhist, Hindu world, from India, uh, who are all now minorities in this country. And America has finally become a full microcosm of the whole world, and therefore must be able to understand the factors within itself. Uh, of course, also from the Islamic side, especially Muslims living in America or Europe, many of them who migrated here, of course, were devout Muslims, but they did not really understand the religion intellectually to be able to explain it. Oftentimes the prayers were in Arabic, but their minds were filled with completely non-Islamic ideas coming from a secularist world. And it's uh, important for them also. A lot of young people, there are a lot of young Muslim students here, many of whom are my own students, for whom the rediscovery of their religion in a language that is contemporary and comprehensible to them is absolutely crucial for their own lives so they can act as the natural bridge that they should be between the Islamic world itself, the bigger Islamic world itself, and the West, both here and in Europe. I've over uh, 40 years now, I've more than that, almost 50 years, I've written books, some in my own mother tongue Persian, but many of them in English, most of them in English. And I hope this last book will be a humble contribution to this better understanding. The book is really meant for those who are sincerely interested in asking themselves the question, what do Muslims believe about Islam? Why someone who knows a little bit about the Islamic world and a little bit about the West, like myself. Unfortunately, people who have both of this, these types of knowledge are not very common among Muslims. There are Muslims who are completely modernized, they just have a Muslim name, and what they say about Islam is totally irrelevant to the Islamic reality. 
There are others who know Islam well, who do not know at all the West. And we have an embassy in Washington which publishes hundreds of books every year. They're all in the basement of the embassy because nobody reads it. Uh, it's, they're totally irrelevant to the language which is needed to bring about comprehension. There are other very fine introductions to Islam, including one by one of the most eminent American scholars who happens to be here, Dr. William Chittick, on the vision of Islam. So this book is not the first introduction. There are many other good introductions. But I hope that this simple introduction, which does not have the heavier uh, sort of philosophical, metaphysical elements in my other books, will be a humble contribution to a better understanding of Islam. And the reason I'm standing you before you here today is not just to sign a few books, but to present to those who are here orally and in person and direct presence uh, what I believe it should be necessary, that is direct encounters with those who represent the Islamic tradition authentically, who know something about the West, and who also have the welfare of the West ultimately, and all the spiritual elements that remain in the West in their heart. Uh, my time is up. I want to conclude by just saying that uh, uh, the destiny of all humanity, of course, is now bound together. There's no way of evading this. In the same way that the Chernobyl disaster affected the lives of people in Lapland, Sweden, uh, far away, what we do in one part of the world now affects the rest of the world. There are no local actions of any great significance which are only local. Their effect, thanks to the misdeeds of modern technology, can lead to immeasurable loss of life, of the destruction of nature, and in a positive sense, they can also bring about a great deal, greater awareness of the fact that we are different humanities, different human collectivities, different religions and cultures living on a single globe and have no other choice but to try to live on this globe in peace and in mutual understanding without in any way denigrating or belittling the identity of each culture. What I've always spoken about is not the domination of one culture or another, but of mutual understanding. And I hope this little book will be a small contribution towards that end. I'd be glad to take any questions which you might have. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, I'd like to uh, pose two. One, you spoke of some other scholars. I wonder if you might uh, speak to any of the translations into English of the Quran that you find either adequate or inadequate. And secondly, one of the sad things of all of the peoples of the book, Jews, Christians, or Muslims is the fact that they get fractured into all sorts of different uh, groups. So you have uh, Protestants and Catholics killing each other 500 years ago and still again in, in Ireland. Uh, I wonder if you might speak to divisions within Islam and uh, you know, what brings them together, what holds them apart. Or right, very quickly, the bad translation of the Quran, I will not say anything about it. There are too many of them. So, <laughs> Uh, so let me just say something about the good what I believe are good translations. First of all, the Quran in its reality is not really translatable because it's the word of God and the body, the form in which the word of God is manifested, that is the Arabic language of the Quran, cannot be completely translated. It's, it's like translating the body of Christ into another body. That is not possible. But it's possible to at least to render some of the meaning of the Quran and some of the poetry and the and compelling literary attraction that it has. And there are, there are a few translations, each of which succeeds in some way. It was the classical translation of Muhammad Marmaduk Pikthal, who was an Englishman who became Muslim and lived in India under the rule of the Nizam of Hyderabad before the partition of India. And uh, his translation is still a good translation. There are some errors in it, but there, it's a good translation. From a poetic point of view, the translation of Arbery, A.J. Arbery, I think is a very good translation poetically, but he skips over certain important interpretations, and therefore, again, there's a lacuna in it. The late Muhammad Assad, who was an Austrian Jew who in 1927 went to the Middle East and became a Muslim, and in fact lived there for such a long time that he became ambassador of Saudi Arabia for a while in the West. Uh, he, uh, he wrote, he translated this uh, in just before the, his death a few years ago is a very good translation, but a bit too rationalistic in, in certain places. There are partial translations by Thomas Cleary, 
this very remarkable American translator who's also translated Dao De Jing from Chinese. He's an incredible translator, but it's not of the total text of the Quran. And Michael Sells, who's a young American scholar from Haverford College, has rendered certain of the, ver of the first of, of the Quran in his book, Approaches to Islam, which is really quite good. As for your second question, in the deepest sense, it is God's mercy that has prevented a religion from having only a single interpretation. Uh, that is, if th that were to be so, there would be a kind of totalitarian imposition and that would overlook the diversity of human types and human mentalities. So every religion, from Buddhism and Hinduism to Islam to Christianity to even Judaism, which is a, is a smaller number, have, have had different schools. Now, the fact that they have led to uh, conflict, and in the case of the Protestant Catholic wars to a hundred year war in Europe, that is not because the fault of the religion, it's the fault of human nature. Whatever falls into the, into, on the level of human nature into, uh, participates in the strife that is within our souls. And that strife manifests itself oftentimes in religious wars. Religious wars are not caused by religion. They're caused by human nature. That's why when man becomes irreligious, the wars continue. Neither Stalin, nor Hitler, nor the First World War, nor the Second World War were fought for religion. They were fought for ideology, and now more and more for oil and economic reasons. So that is not the fault of religion. But yes, there have been conflicts in Islam, as there have been Christianity and elsewhere. And it's false to say that there's only one interpretation of Islam. Islam is not monolithic. And some of these Islamic extremists who say this is Islam that I say everybody else is false and go, is totally false. And we have the mirror image of that in Christianity, of course, and also in Judaism. There are Orthodox Jews who believe that the uh, conservative and Jews and the uh, Reformed Jews will all go to hell. I mean, I just gave a talk two weeks ago at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, which is the center of conservative Judaism, and one rabbi got up and said, what do you say to this, that the Orthodox thing will all go to hell in this auditorium? <laughs> I said, it's for you to decide. Now, in Islam, uh, the major division uh, is between Sunnism and Shiism. Uh, and that needs to be understood. Uh, the uh, intractable uh, situation of Iraq right now is due more than anything else to this fact that the Iraqis are 60% Shiite, and the other 40% are divided between Arabs, Kurds, and a few Turkmen's and Assyrians. And uh, therefore, uh, this was created by the British on a very special plan to be able to control it like this, uh, that if you have democracy, then you have a Shiite state. And if you don't like that, you, have, you cannot side up side with democracy. That's a very, very major problem that the United States is going to face in Iraq very soon. But these are the major divisions. And then there are local ethnic or sometimes tribal interpretations which have also taken hold. And then since the last 19th century, really, there have also been these so-called reformist movements, which I think are misspelled. The reform should be spelled D-E, the deformist movements, uh, which uh, you have and which has ended with things like Wahhabism and all of these extremist forms of Islam, which did not exist in the Islamic world until the advent of modernism, the other side of the coin of modernism, what is called fundamentalism. For example, this is not traditional Islam at all. And one of my views, points which I've expressed both in the heart of Islam and in this little book, Islam is precisely to make the Western audience understand that fundamentalism is not sweeping the Islamic world. If you take a head count, there are no more than 10% of all Muslims who side with this, 90% are still traditional Muslims. The modernists are very few, except, of course, they run governments and decide things. But numerically, they're a very, very small number of people. Yes, but there are those divisions. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, well, or you go. You decide on who should ask questions, yes. Uh, since Islam is the most recent revelation from God, does that make it better than Christianity or Judaism? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, Every religion thinks, uh, that a follower of every religion thinks that his or her religion is the best, otherwise they wouldn't follow it. I mean, if you thought the woman to whom you were married was not the best woman for you to, to ma be married to, uh, or and all women are equal as your wives, I mean, this family would break down immediately. So, so this is obvious. There must be a special love that exists within the heart of the follower of religion for his or her form, which for that person is the best. 
And the Muslims, like Christians, like Jews, like Hindus, believe that their religion is the best. And many give the argument that since Islam came later, therefore it is the best. But uh, my own view, which is not, of course, doesn't start with me, otherwise would be irrelevant, which is the view expressed by Muslim sages through the centuries, by Malik Jalaluddin Rumi, who wrote explicitly verses about this, is that these religions come from God. To, on the basis of his own wisdom, he revealed them in different forms, in different ways. And we, what we can say that Islam is the best for us, but obviously the person who remains Christian and who loves Christ, and for that person, Christianity is the best. I think the Muslim has no right to say you have no right to this feeling. And the Quran is very explicit about that. Thank you for my chance. Uh, good evening and, and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh for Brother and sister in here. Uh, I just uh, finished half of your book. I got so just ask question about the first half of your read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, uh, I just got a very short information, it was a very short uh, explanation about, about the jihad in this book, about holy war. So in this book, it seems like uh, Muslim people uh, are allowed to do everything to, do, to, to get the target. And to, do, to do what? To, to, to do everything. To do everything so it can be people think uh, related to this is like a terrorism also. And then the second one is uh, Muhammad has a, had a wife more than one. That's right. Yes. So look, uh, Islam is not really respect to the monogamy, only one wife. But in this book also really wife, only one and the other wife is for a political reason. What is the meaning of political reason? All right, let me answer this. First of all, the first question, the question of jihad, which has become a favorite term, uh, is replaced the Tao. You know, in the old days, to sell a book, you had to call, say, the Tao of Wall Street, the Tao of physics, you would immediately become a bestseller. Now, you, all authors try to stick the word jihad in because then the sale goes up. And uh, this word, of course, has been demonized and uh, misconstrued and distorted beyond our expectation. It's very, very difficult to clear the ground. Uh, but let me just say very briefly, more, more than in this book, the other book, The Heart of Islam, I have a whole section devoted to the question of jihad. Jihad means exertion in the way of God. In the deepest sense, everything... Uh, pious person does in, in life is jihad because we have to uh, battle constantly against our individualistic egotistical inclinations throughout life this is what really jihad means and the deepest sense is the inner jihad but it also includes the defense of one's family one's religion one's home that is allowed as is allowed in every religion you have the doctrine of just war in christianity which is was debated so vociferously uh, the last two months before the Iraqi war began here in the United in the, was debated in the United States and in Europe. So uh, that meaning also exists, but it's not only that you must carry out war against everybody who's a non-Muslim, because this is, proves, uh, uh, in the hist history of Islam proves this is totally false, because for 1400 years, the Muslims could have carried out a jihad among uh, the Christians and Jews in their, amidst them. They could have crushed them in 24 hours, and they didn't or Zoroastrians in Iran, who continue to live to this day. Certain rulers, certain people have evoked this idea for political ends, in the same way that the word crusade has been used for political ends in the West in many, many different ways. But the, uh, the idea today that the Muslims are all waiting to somehow kill all non-Muslims in the world, this is totally absurd, absolutely absurd. As I said, the, the fault is not that of the West, it's that certain Muslims who have tried to misuse this term uh, and therefore has caused this reaction. As for the case of the Prophet, yes, the Prophet has more than one wife. Uh, his first wife, Khadija, as long as she was alive, he was monogamous, which was until he was 50 years old. Uh, so it wasn't because of, God forbid, lust or something like that, because if, you, if that's the case, there's a lot more sexual power at the age of 25 than there is at the age of 50, as most people in the audience of white hair like me would testify, <laughs> would, would accept. And when I said political, is because there was a society in which, of course, polygamy was practiced on a very wide scale. What Islam did was to limit it. And the other wives of the Prophet were almost always to, to, to create an alliance with some tribe or some other group and something like that, 
uh, some of the wives of the prophet were old women in the 70s and so forth. That's, that's what I meant by the word political. But as to say why was it that the prophet was not monogamous and why did he have more than one wife, again, is to impose a particular interpretation of morality upon another religion. Uh, Solomon and David had 4,000 wives. And in case you do not know, so did Charlemagne, the founder of Western uh, Christian Christendom. Uh, uh, and most of Muslims, of course, are monogamous. But the uh, possibility of polygamy existed for obvious reasons of limiting, in fact, sexual promiscuity. Uh, I've said jokingly that, of course, in the modern West, not Christian ethics, uh, there are a lot more polygamists in Washington than there are in Mecca. There's no comparison. <laughs> except the other people that don't count. I mean, they're not legally accepted. Uh, so it was really to, uh, if you look at the point of view of the fact that sexual activity has to be promulgated according to law, according to divine law, is to minimize the negative effects of that. So it would not have bastard children and it would not have irresponsibility of promiscuity, which unfortunately, of course, is drowning us today. Dr. Nasser, one of the uh, many aspects that readers appreciate about your books is the uh, spiritual parallels that you illuminate between Islam and other religions. One issue that affects all religions of faith is, is this theodicy problem, the idea that there is a benevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient God, but yet there's suffering in the world. How uh, does Islam reconcile uh, this issue as well as other faiths? Uh, he asked a question, which I think I need to elucidate the question uh, before I come to the answer. The word theodicy, which is a bit of a technical term, has uh, one, more than one meaning. But the way it's used in English today, it means the question of how can a good God create a world in which there is evil? That's the question he's asking. And he says, how does Islam answer this question? First of all, let me tell you something I've often told, told my students. is one of the most remarkable uh, facts of religious history is that many people in the West have turned against religion and against God and against Christianity because they could not solve this problem. I mean, all the from Bertrand Russell, why I'm not a Christian, down to many, many other works written by philosophers and ordinary people. You always meet people in every walk of life. So I cannot believe in God. There's so much evil in the world. The Holocaust posed this very, very big challenge, of course, to Jewish theologians and thinkers and ordinary Jews also. How could such a great tragedy take place? Now, outside of the Western world, I do not know a single non-Westerner who has left religion because of this question. It's a very interesting fact. Not only Muslims, but Hindus, Buddhists, Shintoists, Confucians, anybody, and Oriental Jews. Uh, the reason that this problem has come about like this and has caused such a furor in Western Christianity and has caused so many people to turn away from religion is that they do not want to understand that the world is not God. There is the metaphysics behind it, is that the world is created. Creation implies separation from God, and only God is good. And therefore, this separation implies distance from goodness, which is really the root of evil. And Islamic thinkers have written some very, very profound pages, especially Ibn Arabi, but many others, Rumi, others have the great Sufi writers especially, and also certain theologians like Ghazali, who was both a Sufi and a theologian, about this issue. That is, this, why should this be a problem? That is, if God is absolute goodness, nothing else can be pure goodness, because nothing else can be God. So the question that people should be asking is, why did God create the world? That's the real question. Not why is there evil in the world? The world is always the world. You know, the famous Arab saying, Adunya, Adunya. That is, the world is the world. And you do not expect perfection in the world because the world is not God. The more profound question I said is, why did God create the world? And Islam has an answer for that. Uh, for many Christian theologians, said this was a mystery, or uh, God loved the world, so created the world and gave it his only son, as the New Testament says. Uh, for Islam, it is the famous hadith uh, that is God wanted to be known. And so he would create the world so that he would be known. In a sense, the world is a self-manifestation. 
A Self-Disclosure of God. This is a title of one of the wonderful books that William Chittick written recently, The Self-Disclosure of God, in which the world is God's own self-disclosure. And God needs, quotes unquote, disclosure because he's infinite. And the divine infinitude must include the possibility of manifestation, of creation, of khalq, of self-disclosure. And therein writes, lies the root of, a, of the understanding of why there is the world. It's really too profound a metaphysical question for me to analyze more than that. But uh, the important thing for this audience is that to know is that Islamic thinkers and ordinary people were never disturbed by this problem religiously. There's no taxi driver in Cairo who has to drive 16 hours a day and is very poor, has to feed 12 people, his sister and sister-in-law and grandmother and aunt, they're all sitting home waiting for him to bring the bread to say, oh, what a horrible world, there's so much injustice in the world, not to talk about what the governments do to them, and therefore there is no God. That's what's important to understand, that this question never challenged their belief in either the goodness of God or in the almighty power of God. But to explain that theologically was in the domain of the theologians and especially the metaphysicians. We have time for a couple quick more questions. We'll go Ask here the ladies. and then we'll go to the back. Um, one of the, I think, misconceptions, especially in the Western world, is that women in Islam are oppressed. So I guess if you could maybe say something to that. And then also, um, among Muslim women themselves, there's some, I guess, some women who wear the you know, hijab and some women who don't. So can you also say something about that? First of all, the question of women being oppressed, of course, is a relative historical term. I think if you looked at women of 1950 in the United States, when I, I was a student at Harvard, if someone came out with one of those little short pants that they wear at GW or the belly buttons showing, they would be arrested in Cambridge, Massachusetts immediately. And that means the women were, uh, were oppressed in Cambridge in 1950. This is a complete relative term. People in this country take the particular situation of themselves and try to globalize it and say, why isn't everyone like us? So this question, I think, is a misplaced question, but it's done on purpose. It's called the uh, uh, rod with which you want to hit the Islamic world in the head. Now, there's been a lot of oppression of women in Islamic civilization, as there has been in Christian civilization in the West. There are more wife beating in the United States than probably in Iran or someplace like that, uh, I mean, because people drink more here. Uh, I mean, obviously, nobody wants to talk about these matters. These are taboo matters, but I'll talk about it. I have nothing to lose to talk about these matters. So this question is really uh, relevant to social structures, to what social structures were when a religion came into a particular situation. And the fact that the West, the Western society has evolved in this particular way and other societies have not, doesn't mean anything. I mean, each society has its own uh, line of development or either decadence or rise or whatever it is. And the situation in women in the Islamic world was not that different from the situation of women in China or Japan. Uh, the fact that now China has become communist and uh, things have changed has nothing to do with classical Chinese civilization. As for the question of the veil, now, uh, this is a very important question. The Quran says that women should not reveal their zina, their ornaments, to those who are not of their family, let's say father, mother, husband, and so forth. Uh, when Islam came into where it came, that is, into Western Asia, the covering of the hair was a sign of religious respect before God, not only for Muslim, for everybody else. I always say this jokingly, uh, have you ever seen an image of the Virgin Mary with her hair up like that? She always has, of course, a veil on her, on her, uh, face, uh, on her head. And so everybody wore uh, something that covered their head. And even a country like Spain or Greece, until recently, all older, older women would cover their hair. If you go to Thessalonica, let's say in northern Greece, right into a village, it's not very different from a village in Tehran, uh, Armenia. Georgia, the Oriental Eastern countries, which are affected by this kind of cultural uh, practice. So the wearing of the veil uh, became part and parcel of the way of decency, you might say, of covering uh, one's uh, attractive parts of the body and so forth and so on. Uh, and it was practiced throughout the Islamic world. But also the men all covered their head uh, in the old days, like, let's say, pious Jews 
put a yarmulke on their head, even now, uh, especially when you're going to a synagogue. This was shared by Muslims and Jews. And in fact, the w women of Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn, they look just like Muslim women. Uh, no difference as far as even now covering their hair is concerned. It's not unique to Islam. In the 19th century, when Western ideas came into the Islamic world, a number of people became gradually modernized. And uh, modernized people were the people who run the governments because the Western colonial powers wanted to have their own agents running those countries. And even when, after they left, they left their agents there. Uh, always in all this country, you have a small minority of people who are westernized, who rule over a vast majority who are not. And the question of democracy, everybody talks about it. If you really had democracy in the Islamic world, you would have much less pro-Western governments. To put it mildly, uh, nobody talks about uh, down the, where M Street gets into Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, and that's a very important issue. Now, as a result of that, a number of women uh, were forced in Turkey and Iran. These two countries forced their women to take off their veil. Ataturk, Kamal Ataturk was the first person who did that after he came to power in 1924 in Turkey, and also banned the traditional male dress. That is the covering of the head with the fina and things like that were all banned in Turkey. And Reza Shah in Iran did the same thing, uh, what was called kashve hijab in Persian, that is taking off the veil. In other countries like Egypt, where it was not coerced and it was not done by force, some women decided to take off the veil some women did not, and you have still today in Cairo, you have all the way from young Egyptian girls in the American University of Cairo to devout people in the bazaar, Khan Khalili Bazaar, and you have a whole spectrum. Countries which did not give up the traditional dress, like the subcontinent of India, let's say Muslims of Pakistan or Bangladesh or within India itself, the traditional dress itself always included something that you covered your hair with. And so the crisis was not even that great. So you have today in the Islamic world different interpretations of this. And the countries in which this was done by force are the very countries in which reaction set in. In Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran has tried to force the, the veil on those, including the modernized women, who therefore wear the veil in the street and they come to big parties and they're wearing bikinis underneath, you know, that, I'm just joking, but uh, I mean, the extreme, because of the fact that there's, again, a coercion from the outside. In certain countries, such as Egypt, uh, there has been a movement of reassertion of one's identity from starting in the 60s. So today, you have a lot more Egyptian doctors and lawyers who are women who cover their hair than the, you did at the time of Jamal Abdel Nasser when the, the Egyptian revolution of 1952 was carried out. So you have this diversity in different Islamic societies on the basis of this historical process, some of which I discussed with you. I don't have time to get to the back, but we'll take one from the back. Uh, considering that uh, everybody has their own logic about religion, um, and therefore they have a, a personal religion. What I'm wanting to ask you is, do you think uh, that governments should separate um, religion from politics? Do you think that the, the rulers should be uh, secular rulers? I think this uh, debate that is going on all the time, separation of church and state and so forth, is really uniquely American experience. In fact, as far as I've been able to understand, the idea of the founding fathers of this country of freedom of religion was not meant freedom from religion, which secularists soon interpreted it to be. Today, freedom of religion is an excuse for freedom from religion. And also Christianity had a church and a state. Uh, even today, the head of the Church of England is the King of England or the queen at the present moment. She's the head of the Anglican Church. It is she who has to put the final approval upon the Archbishop of Canterbury and all the major bishops of the Anglican Church. And also in Germany, Lutheranism. Of course, in the Catholic world, many, many Catholic countries. So the, uh, there was, even in Christianity, there was never a total separation of church and state, although Christ said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. Now, Islam, like Judaism, people don't want to mention this, I mention it on purpose, is doesn't have that dichotomy. Let's remember that the first state in the 20th century established on the basis of religion is Israel. 
long before this fundamentalism began in the Islamic world. Because, and that's quite understandable. Besides all of the historical tragedies that occurred to the Jewish people, especially during the Second World War, the horrendous tragedies, the Jewish view of religion is that the two cannot be separated. And there is today within Israel a tremendous tension between the Orthodox rabbis who want to control the law of the land and many European Jews, Ashkenazi, who migrate to Israel who do not accept that. Now, uh, this is not going to work in the Islamic world unless Islamic society itself is desacralized, is secularized. And for a while this was tried, uh, from the late 19th century and especially with the independence movements that came in the early 20th century, this was tried. But what's usually called Arab liberalism or something like that was an abysmal failure. And it died really when all the Arab countries together lost the 1967 war. That was really the death knell for both Arab nationalism and this kind of secularism. In most Islamic countries, there's not a question of the church ruling over society. The case of the Islamic Republic of Iran is the first time in Islamic history that the ulama, that is religious scholars, are ruling directly over society. That's something else. That's an exception. What ha will happen in the future, only God knows. But uh, historically, uh, always, politics was not separable from religion in the sense that religious principles had to apply to politics as much as to individual piety. And is that which is really significant. So I would not even couch this in the, question, in the context of religion versus secularism or the church and the state. It's the question of what role does religion play in public life. You know, there are many fundamentalist Protestants today who in fact are bringing religion back into the American political scene in an unfortunately very, what I consider a very unfortunate way. But if they had the power that let's say Muslims have in uh, Egypt, they would uh, impose a Christian rule over the whole of the United States. I mean, you've read about this, everybody talks about this. So even for Christianity, that is not a solved problem completely. As far as the Islamic world is concerned, I do not think under any condition will you capture Islamic world with troops and try to impose rule over the, anything else, that there will ever be this kind of separation of church and state that we speak about in this country, because there is no church in Islam. What is the church? It is the individual Muslims who, in fact, must follow the divine law, and the divine law incorporates not only personal habits, but also how we live in society, and therefore what in the larger context would be called politics and even economics. Thank you very much. Islam, Religion, History, and Civilization. It is published by Harper Collins. We thank you very much for joining us this evening in Georgetown. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's wait till the crowd. Islam, Religion, History, and Civilization is published by Harper San Francisco, a division of Harper Collins. Visit harpercollins.com for more information.